Well, welcome to a new story arc for the USS Reliant uh, game played using Star Trek Adventures set in the Star Trek Online universe. Uh, we have a number of former Foundry authors contributing ideas for stories and playing characters. We have live streamers and um, other friends with wonderful personalities that just really bring the crew of this ship to life. Uh, we start with the ship's uh, commanding officer, Marcus Graves. Hello, hello, hello. The ship's sec uh, the ship's first officer, Alenis Kendra. Hello. The ship's chief engineer, Rick Tier, the first soar in Starfleet. Uh, greetings. Uh, we have our chief science officer, Quentin Reynolds, also married to uh, executive officer, Alenis Kendra. Salutations. We also tonight have with us uh, ship's pilot, uh, the third, uh, you can clear that up, third or fourth of uh, an original race called the Ivy that was created by Duncan Idaho. And uh, uh, that's Kara Junrani, the ship's pilot and life sciences officer. Kara Junrani here, third Ivy in Starfleet. I boosted the server, so hopefully the audio quality is better this week. Please let us know if you listen. And last and certainly not least is the ship's doctor, Dr. Eli O'Connor, who uh, comes from a proud Starfleet tradition and uh, is going to be where we start this week. But first, let Dr. O'Connor introduce himself. Hi, I'm Dr. Eli O'Connor, the ship's CMO. My ha family's being held hostage. Please send Section 31. Q's holding them hostage. <laughs> kidding. He's not kidding. Yes, yeah, send I'm section not. 31. I totally will not phaser them all and turn them into the brig. I definitely, definitely not, will not phaser anyone who claims to be section 31. Yes, they are the good guys. Yes. Now Lieutenant Tardigrade is getting confused and pointing a phaser at everyone. And he's got a lot of arms. He can do that. He begins chewing on the phaser. Well, oh, this, no. well this arc of uh, Reliant story is tying into the low-level uh, introduction of PvP in the uh, in the video game that we all play, and it is called Klingon War Stories. Uh, the first episode I'm calling Six Days, because as I said a little bit earlier, we begin in the quarters of Kara Junrani, where she is attempting to do something in the replicator unit. It doesn't seem to be going well. Kara carefully pours out the multicolored volatile concoction into a glass and sets it very gingerly inside the replicator. All right, come on. You're the pinnacle of Starfleet technology. There's no way that something Hazra came up can be something you can't replicate. She moves over to the control panel, slowly turning up the scanner power. Come on, come on. A line of silver light falls around the glass. Come on. The light intensifies. And then suddenly the machine explodes into sparks, throwing Kara backwards. She sits up off the floor. Oh, she taps her communicator. Baz, I need help. I broke the replicator again. You mean Rick? Yeah, Rick. Sorry. That was going <laughs> great until then. <laughs> um, we, switch, uh, we, we switch pretty quickly, actually. Rick... Rick is uh, will already be in the um, in the lounge area where the party is happening. The only other person that has something that they will see before uh, the scene is set for everyone to talk about what they're doing at the promotion party for the doctor, um, and that is uh, that is Marcus. Uh, getting a good look at the orders that uh, that Starfleet sent with essentially as high a priority as 
as they can send. And it is indicating that um, the conflict between the Federation and the Klingon Empire in the neutral zone has begun to intensify. And one of the things that is uh, one of the things that is occurring is there are a number of systems that were more skirmish zones that have started to become zones of real contention. One of those pieces is a system called Karat that has a large that, that has a large mining operation that takes place on one of the moons and the reports that are uh the orders that you got uh that, that you got um Marcus show you that the USS Toledo USS Reliant and the USS Basilope three of the five ships in your fleet not your personal fleet, but three of the five ships that are in the second exploration fleet for the the unexplored territory that you're commonly in are being rerouted to deep space K7 uh, because it hasn't been very long since Vega. It's been a couple of months. Um, There's still talk about there are still people trying to figure out ways to get Vega and, you know, to do something. And uh, so so the idea that the Borg have shown, like, basically that the Borg have shown themselves in in this quadrant of space again is fresh in everybody's mind. And Borg probe ships and a few, meaning three separate uh, spheres have been reported in the Karat system. That's why your ships are being outed, because of the presence of the Borg in the system. That's what you know, and the ship is already en route at maximum possible cruising speed. Um, you know that when you get this information, Eli's party is probably just started. When you're finished reading it all, that is. And so, that is, that's where we're going to pick up. And you guys can go right from that right into the party when it seems natural. So I just wanted to do a comment on Gray's reaction to those orders. Um, so he's going to think back to the conversation he had with Waitley about... Uh, effectively not losing confidence and be, being made captain for a reason. And he's going to take a step back, try to push away the sort of the worry and the fear that comes along with engaging the Borg in the circumstance and what factors he can't control to start developing plans for what he can control. So that is going to be his reaction and then he's going to be hit in the back of the head by a small bouncing ball thrown at him by Lieutenant Tardigrade. Because he's impatient to go to the party, and he's just going to point a thumb to the door, and Lieutenant Tardigrade's going to uh, skittle out into the hallway and go to the party. While Graves remains in his quarters. And that's all I've got. The other thing that um, that Graves would know as he as he sits thinking about it is that when Reliant arrives at K seven, it will immediately begin. Uh, uh, it will. It's not a refit. It's uh, it's a modules trade out. Um, the Reliant is currently packed with science modules, for you know for using. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, for using the uh, for use in the exploration of strange new worlds and new civilizations. Kind, kind of. Um, it's um, 
your what what your science pods are being pulled out and the reliant is going to have big long metal arms by the time you leave uh K7 after being there only a few hours um <clears throat> but they're what they're they're putting in search and rescue pod uh, pods and additional medical pods, which include uh, a large amount of power that uh, you don't, you, depending on how deeply uh, Graves would read into it, a large amount of power is going to be being routed through sick bay, and um, you will be receiving uh, one. It's it's verified that you'll be receiving one new off one new senior or um not, not senior staff one new one new staff member at K seven a liberated Borg doctor who uh, has a who apparently has specialty in uh, in the act of liberating someone from the board um that's the medical specialty of uh, a, a person that you see uh, that you you see their their file if you want to look at it and such um their name is dr three a yep. uh just dr three so he's going to note that information and just make careful note of what's being removed from the ship and what's being added to the ship. So he knows what capabilities he'll have in working with Borg. Okay. So he's going to spend some time looking at the technical schematics and processing that information. Hey, uh, I'll tell you the big thing that's being added is a Borg restoration alcove in sick bay. Um, you're pretty sure Eli doesn't know that's happening yet. <laughs> He's worried um, about telling him at this point. Um because the doctor, um, what you read in her what you read in her file is that she is she she is fully liberated from the collective of the board. However, the medical information that she has that makes her a specialist is what part of what the Borg put into her. And if it's like if certain implants are removed, it would remove her ability to do the job that she has found purpose in doing now that she's not with the collective. She's not an enlisted officer. She is a petty officer, um, adjunct to Starfleet Medical through the Dyson. Uh, is it the Dyson Institute? Uh, what is it called? Seven of Nine worked for them it called the Dyson Institute Daystrom or Daystrom Institute Daystrom, Daystrom Institute um, she's she's working adjunct through Starfleet Medical uh, but her her primary uh, not assignment but where she works is the Daystrom Institute um, and following the seeing the captain receiving those orders uh, we shift to. I don't know if there's music. Um, oh yeah, there's not, music. I was going to say I don't know exactly the vibe in the room, but the um, the lounge in the I was in the reliant. Holodeck. Oh, holodeck! Great. Yeah, so that, we could change things, have holographic bands. That's that's even better. Um, there's uh, there's a great holodeck party going on, which makes me. Um, you know, very happy. Um, one NPC that you guys have on board is at the party along with any of you who want to be. If you don't want to be at the party, that's fine, but that is the main thing happening on board the Reliant for the end of this day when you got the orders to begin uh, your journey toward toward the neutral zone. So, you're picking up in the hollow deck uh, as... Dr. O'Connor describes it for us. Um, okay. By the way, just real quick, Nord said he would be there, so for all intents and purposes, like I'm just going to treat him like he's there even though he's not here. He is lounging. He's lounging. Drinking. He's drinking. <laughs> By Nord, he means our compatriot, Chaplain uh, Victor Waitley. Yes. All right, so... God damn, I didn't really put a lot of thought into like the scenery. Um 
I guess it looks sort of like a... What, what's the club on Earth space, Doc? 47. Yeah, Club 47. Except for, like, between the songs, like, the furniture and, like, the lighting changes with the hollow deck to, like, uh, depending on the vibe of the song. And, like, just everything on the table stays in place, but the table, those change place. On, on, there's a stage nearby, and on it there seems to be, like, a, a man dressed in black... Like, give me a second. A man dressed in black, black hair. Looks very out of place but he's playing a he's playing a song um, I'm gonna post the song and the picture of the guy because I do love this guy I'm gonna post that in a game chat you notice he, he also has pointed ears despite being a human I, I think you're right Kara it's not the hollow deck, but there is a uh, there is a lounge on board the Reliant and it is Club 42 it has all you need for life, the universe, and everything. And that that is uh that is the guy. You could see yeah, he actually does have pointed ears. We're gonna have to include this. That, that's Please. totally fine that there's a, a you guys basically have Voltaire playing some it, live. It songs. is Voltaire, I just didn't know if anybody would know. Of course I know. Of course I Voltaire is the one who created the USS Make Shut Up. I know, but I mean, like the other people, I know you would know. Um, So, yeah, you're having a party in the holodeck. Um, I would say that because uh, the captain gave you the go-ahead to have have the celebration in the holodeck, that drew more attention than if you had only had it in the lounge. So over the course of the first couple of hours of hanging out there in, uh, in, in the holodeck, you see more faces than you can count and more people than you know come and go from the holodeck. Um, there's, a, there's a steady 20, between 20 and 25 people, sometimes a few more, sometimes a few less, but... There's a, a pretty decent crowd just hanging out in the holodeck thanks to you right now. I just want to also add, I, I have the spiciest curry on one of the tables that's legally allowed in the Federation. <laughs> Whoever eats it gets, gets like, bonus points. <laughs> Whoever eats it marinated in Hazra's drink. I don't have any Hazra stuff, so... Oh, Kara still has a keg. Well, I don't have it, so... I, I, don't have it. Egg. Like that. I don't have any of Hazra's stuff. <laughs> Kara, you're bringing the keg. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to make this a captain's order, but I'm going to make it implicit that Lieutenant Tardigrade wants it there. <laughs> Actually, no, no, no. Let's do that scene. We'll do that scene. So Lieutenant Tardigrade goes to Kara's quarters. <laughs> Actually, don't worry about that. I was going to bring it anyway, but the moment I was trying to check and see if Oakley wanted to follow Kara in, I had some funny ideas for him, but I oh, don't want to do just that use. Too, but... I just I don't want to just use Oakley without permission. So, um, Lieutenant Tardigrade's going to go to Kara's quarters, ring the door. The door opens. There's some black Le- ooze that sludges out. Lieutenant Tardigrade steps in and just sort of like nods to Kara and then just starts looking around. Kara watches him go around. What are you doing? Uh, where's the Hosmer's keg? Oh, that. I put it in a box. I was going to give it to Eli. Uh, uh, can I bring it? Okay, but it's from both of us then, all right? Okay, so he, he, is he directed to the box? Kara goes to her desk and pulls the box out of a drawer and hands it carefully to... Lieutenant Tardigrade. It's heavier than it looks, being full of liquid of unknown properties. And, yeah, so he he takes it and then just starts rolling it, like, down the hall really fast. So when when it opens, the contexts are going to be well shaken. Oh, God. And potentially more dangerous. Oakley, summoned to the deck by Kara's call to help, comes in and looks, takes one look at her replicator, one look at Kara, 
decides to go about fixing Kara's burnt uniform and just follows her as she follows the tower grade out. Thank you, Oakley. The replicator's probably a lost cause, I know. It takes only a few moments for the entire trio to move down to the holodeck, where I would guess that Tardigrade is probably going to enter the room first. Yep, yep, he's going to be really, really excited. Um, you get to make a perception check, Clara, um, which, um, Baz, just tell me if I get it right. I believe that it would be insight and security. Uh, that would work. So your target number is 14 and your critical range is 1. Um, so two dice, your target number is 14. You only need one, uh, one success. Well, that's good, because I got one success. Got one success. Um, third grade is very... Uh, uh, John is very intent on getting the the keg to the party and Oakley is following along the you know the the exocomp is following along with you and you notice um notice an ops officer uh down by club 42 it's just, it, club 42 is a very small place um it 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 Maybe suits ten or twelve people at the most, and uh, we'll we'll figure out like you know who runs the you know who who makes the drinks there and that kind of thing. But it is uh, being that you're all kind of junior officers and lower decks at this point. Um, you still you know that a good number of people make their way through that place when they're not on shift. It's one of the more uh, one of the more popular places, it's just one of the more popular places for officers, non-commissioned officers. Um, it's just a place people go to relax and it's popular. And you notice an ops officer um, at the wall display outside of the place. Uh, can't think of, you can't think of any reason they, that somebody would be changing the wall display uh, just down and across, you know, just kind of across from where Club 42 is. You see an ops officer change the wall display and just shake, uh, shake her head and um, walk back and walk down a different way in the hallway back to other duties. Hmm. She looks over at Oakley. Do you think we should do something about that, or do you think we should just go to the club? I mean, I'm not going to go get up in anybody's business, I don't think. If um, uh, I, I'm certain that Oakley is capable of um, – it, it, it's all of 30 feet of hallway. Oakley could probably speed right down there, see what's up, and come back and report to Kara if that's what you want Oakley to do. Oakley has a lot of very good, um, what's the word? Um, he's got a lot of utility usage that, 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 that people could get a lot out of with Oakley. I like, I like the idea that we have a, a probably sentient exocomp. Thank you, Star for Theta. At the, sign of Oakley, at the sign of Oakley wanting to go check it out, Kara goes with the little old guy, not wanting to leave the exocomp alone. Not doubting his abilities, of course, but he's already been shot once. Okay. Um, you get down there and you just see um, that the board outside of Club 42 has changed. Um, the, uh, the overall... Uh, because this, one of the things that you can see listed on this board is that the assignment of the Reliant has that the that the Reliant has been placed on war footing and is going into the neutral zone. Um, there is a list of ships that are already 
um, in the neutral zone, as well as ships that are going to the neutral zone, as well as if you want, if you wanted, if you wanted to, you could find out the crew on every ship on on the list. Um, and you realize that what this is literally is that board that got put up in Deep Space Nine. Do you remember those episodes where? Julian and Jadzia and I think Miles would meet at the the place that the the people who died in the Dominion War were announced. Um that that's what this board is going to be. Oh. This board this this your ship just got the war update board based somewhere that's extremely convenient for everyone on the crew to find it when they want to go looking for it. Oh, and geez. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. Um, Oakley, could, could you store this information in case anybody at the party asks for it? I really hope they don't. Happy <laughs> promotion day. <laughs> and- Once Oakley, Tara is the last one to enter the party with uh with Well Tardigrade's gonna enter just before her, so we'll get to that. Right. So anyway, once Oakley saves the information and beeps, Kara says, Thank you, Oakley. Um look, if we're going to war, try not to get shot again, okay? That was really scary before. All right. She gives the little exocompa pat and they chase after Lieutenant Tardigrade. Uh what you missed, Eli, is that an operations officer changed the wall display outside of the ship lounge to essentially. Yeah, ship lounge, so. No, it's it's a... <laughs> but as Kara was on her oh, way okay. there, she saw this, and Kara now is realizing while going to like this happy party, her ship just got the casualty report board put on it. That's that's that sucks. <laughs> Kara, you know, there's no on it yet. Kara, you know, rounds the corner with Oakley, grumbling. Uh, first, Tardigrade takes my gift. Well, actually, first the replicator blows up, then Tardigrade takes my gift, and now this. Thanks for walking with me, Oakley. At least I have somebody to go with. And they arrive. You see just Lieutenant with... Tardigrade. Well, go there's right going to be one team with Lieutenant Tardigrade. He'll be coming around from behind you, still rolling the keg. What the? He didn't know where the party was, so he just made a loop. Tardy, head for the. We're going to the holodeck. Turbo lift. Okay. Here. And, and he follows. Whispers to Oakley. I guess we didn't have to chase him after all. They take the turbo lift down and head for the holodeck. Is there anything any of you want to do during Eli's party? I'm uh, just waiting for Tardigrade to go through the door. <laughs> I mean, I'm falling behind him, so I was kind of waiting for him to make the first move. Okay, <laughs> I was waiting for anyone who wanted to interject, like Rick or Ke- uh, Kendra or Quentin. Well, we've got a new order I then. See it is everybody there. Uh, how about uh, Rick uh, approaches uh, Eli to ask about his little, uh, well, not so little, Rizin Corvette? Okay, as you're approaching me, I am mixing a drink. I am, I have some something that looks like an energy drink in a glass, and I just drop a shot of Romulan whiskey into it. I call it a singularity bomb. It just sort of blink, blinks at that and and just sort of for a moment uh, tries to determine whether you should comment on it or not and decides to not um, as he uh, uh, as he returns you know back to face Eli and says well what are your plans for the uh, Corvette that you uh, recently acquired. Um. Sending it back to Earth. My father said he wants to take a look at it. 
got any plans for upgrading or um, enhancing the features of the vessel? Possibly. Let me just ask you something. It's known to be a smuggling ship, right? All the stuff that was pretty much displayed on stuff. Like all the hiding spots. Question. If, you know, if they're all documented, why would it be worth shit smuggling in smuggling and known hiding spots when people already know how to, where to look. The Corvette that you have doesn't have any of those smuggly spots. It is a designed racing vessel. Um, in fact... I thought you said um, it had smuggling spots. Did I? Like, yeah, when we were doing the thing, like anybody... Yeah, Larissa, when she was looking it up, said, you said that she had found the Let's say they were creatively described, but they were obviously smuggling compartments. Ah, uh, yes, yes, there are. Um, it's not something that's. It's obviously not something that's known about the ship. It's certainly not in any of the. Uh, it, it's certainly not in any of the blueprints, etc. Kind of thing, Eli. Um, but uh, what you have is a very good security officer. Um, a very good security and tactical officer who was like, let me find out what I can find out about your ship. And it's, it's, these ships are designed with smuggling compartments. They're not always in the same spot. Um, you know, but, uh, yeah, uh, Byzians are, are known to produce fast ships that can run blockades. I think it's more of a um, silent feature than a announced feature. Precisely. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just drunk and I'm blabbing on like, yeah, there's smuggling spots. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, guys. I got to refill my water. I'll be right back. Considering the nature of of Rizian. Well, interactions, I wouldn't necessarily be surprised that that they'd be interested in some in things that might not necessarily be uh, popular or necessarily legal in at least some areas. That's true. Part of me is thinking about treating it in. I know that sounds like a stupid idea, but... I know it's a nice ship, but I'm, uh, hold on a second. I know it's a nice ship, but, like, could get something even cooler. Are you planning on uh, gambling your way up? Gambling my way up? No, not exactly per se. <laughs> I'm not perping loudly, no. <laughs> I I part of me wants to trade it in for an F seventeen. Uh would I know would I know what an F seventeen is? Uh, I presume it's the yeah, aircraft I, but I, no, the, no, um, isn't that the La Serena class? Yes, that is. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. A Capellan F seven fast freighter. But I think it's probably, my guess is it's probably smaller than the Rising Corvette. Exactly. So fast. Not even Pelican sized. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's faster, but uh, I don't believe it would have a, anywhere near as much space for legitimate cargo, not um, even counting the um, more illicit areas, more hidden cargo areas. Yeah, maybe, but still, I just think it'd be cooler. Like, eventually, like, 20, 30, maybe even 40 years from now, I retire, I, I have that ship to just explore. So y y you wouldn't be able to... You'd be able to man an F7 by yourself, but not the Corvette? 
pretty much. Plus, come on, like, I like the advanced hollow, hollow, uh, systems on that. Uh, on the Capellan? <laughs> yeah, um, wait, Capellans? Capellans? This is the wrong universe for Capellans. Is it? No, I'm pretty sure <laughs> they're, uh... What is the name of the freighter again? Uh, that... No, because you've got um, James Leonard Akar, who is a Capellan. Ah. Uh-huh. Sorry, Leonard James Akar. So, uh, what is the, the, the freighter is a Capellan F7 ass freighter, right? So. It's smaller, requires less crew. We saw that. Um, the, um, the difference between the two ships that, you know, doctor, you may not think of it because you're, you know, you're drinking. Um, there's no ship that exists. It is faster than what the Rysians just produced. I don't care about that. I just think it's, um, no, 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 no. I, yeah, you, have to you know, the differences between the two. The Here. Corvette will require more crew, and it is the fastest ship currently produced anywhere in the galaxy. When the uh, DM bro- drops this kind of information, we want to really pay attention to it because we might need a really fast ship at some point. We can trade it oh, later. God. I know. Uh, All right, later, later, later. I'm later. not going to trade it right later. Long term <laughs> retirement plan. <laughs> if we don't blow it up, <laughs> we don't blow things up first. Oh, you gotta totally blow it up at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and just like Eli's at the window. No. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I have just set up the future funny. Oh, uh, and oh. I just imagine Eli at this point, he's just like staring at the screen, staring daggers specifically at my name icon. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you very much, Kara. It's Kaplan, not Capellan. Kaplan S7. Aspirators. Yes, good. It's not the Capellans. That's fine. I just but, but Capellans uh, are I'm a thing in the Star Trek universe. I'm, I'm just glad we know the real name. Um, so yeah, it's certainly son, the Kaplan F17, not F7. I like it. Um, so that will be, you know, that can be your, um, I dream of getting this ship someday. I think any ship that came in like a lock box or a promo box, I'm going to make you win by gambling. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, so what is going to make us get them the legitimate way that we normally would from the game? <laughs> Same odds. Got to be that that. I, um, Actually, with Eli rolling, we have better odds. Eli rolled really well. Um, okay. Well, okay. So um, <laughs> th- they're having that conversation. Lieutenant Tardigrade quickly and excitedly rolls the keg over to Eli. Yo, what's this? It, it, it is from present, from Kara, and I, I rolled it. Kara walks in with. Oakley there, having just finished fixing her uniform. Oakley immediately replicates a small confetti cannon on his front and fires it, which results in small confetti, which vanishes when out of range of the emitter. (laughs) This keg, I I start to try to lift the keg to put on the table. This is great to celebrate my promotion. That's uh, right there to the side. This is... uh, be, be careful with that, Eli. It's a touch, um... Careful with... Volatile. What? The keg. It's it's a touch volatile. This is the stuff that Hazra had from, uh, Ryza. It's, um, it's good, but don't, don't, don't shake it too much. I shaked it a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's what worries I... me. Open, 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 oh. open, 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 open. I'm scared. Right open. Before you, uh, right before you open it, Larissa uh, puts her hand on your shoulder, Eli, and says, "I'm gonna, I'm going to go turn in. Congratulations on your promotion, Doctor." And she's Thank you. The, I promote. She Ever- is the first. To, like people have come and gone all night, but she's like 
the first one you notice that looks like like when she leaves like she's the first one who leaves the party and nobody no no other people drift in after she goes it's starting to get toward that middle of uh middle of the evening you've you've only got maybe another good hour or hour and a half left of uh party left in you as uh as he sets up the keg, the keg starts to make a strange fizzing sound that's slowly getting louder. And in addition to Larissa leaving, down and back away. most of the people around Eli start to back away as well. I've, I've, I have put it down and start backing away. I'm going with them. Fuck this. Lieutenant Tardigrade goes towards the keg. <laughs> Kara ducks down and pulls Oakley with her behind some yeah, holographic cool. scenery. Cool. Careful, Tardy! He opens it. Do you open a keg? Uh, he he um, used his claws and improvised. Remind me never to make him angry. That works. I can now say that he there used his be. claws and improvised and broke in the top of a keg. I'm good with that. And nothing happens because it's not a carbonated beverage. Kara looks up over the scenery. I kind of swore it was explosive, though. Oakley nods and beeps. Why Please tell the replicator. Why why would you wait, what what about the replicator? Um, don't don't this is good, but don't don't try to replicate it. It the, the replicator doesn't like it. She points and, at the multicolored liquid in the keg. Lieutenant Tardigrade at this point elaborates by holding his like doing a uh accompanying gesture and saying, Boom! Oh god. I'm I'm just gonna stick to singularity bombs. Those go boom too. Look, Kendra this, turns it's, not around. A real, it's not a real bomb. Kendra turns around. Is that what happened to her replicator? It was anything something. Our our whole our whole quarters, they smell so vile right now. Kara gulps and puts her hand up. Yeah, that was me. Everybody else points at her too. Kara quickly under stickers and rolls her eyes. Kara quickly sneaks off before Kendra can give her a talking to and goes over to Eli. Hey Eli, I'm sorry I'm late, but Oakley and I are both here and along with Tardigrade and we're all very happy for your promotion. She goes to give him a hug. I, I am I'm just sipping my drink and trying to hug. This is the exact opposite of Ryzen now. <laughs> Kara chuckles. Okay, I can see you've had a bit much. Do be careful with the stuff Hazard gave, all right? I'm going to have at least one glass of it, but it's... Well, I have to pilot tomorrow, so no more than that. And let me tell you, it is strong. And you know, I, 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 got, I, got, I got hypos. I could give you the, the anti-drunk hypo. It's fine. I'm fine. Well, I do believe Kara's, he himself is drunk. Car size. Eli, I just want to let you know that I... I was really jealous at first about the whole promotion thing when I first heard it, but I've I thought this I is thought about it. Hearing it now. Look, I have ways of learning things. She grins at him. Oh, oh no. But anyway, look. The point I wanted to make is that I was I only learned a few hours ago, but I was still pretty jealous about it at first. But then I thought back to some stuff that Chaplain Waitley told me, and I think. I've got a better handle on my anxiety now. Your success doesn't diminish anything I've got going for me. So I just want you to know that I am really happy for you. And anyway, the race to commander is a marathon, not a sprint. She gently punches him in the shoulder. Uh, <laughs> uh, nice. I, I take a sip from my drink. Just so you know, every time I take a sip in game, I'm taking a sip in real life. Oakley hovers up with two bowls, a vase, a hollow horn, and some cups. Car takes the horn and dips it down into the multicolored liquid. Yay! It fizzes. It's a drinking horn. Thank you, Oakley. A replicated drinking horn. I want a drinking horn. Why am I drinking out of this glass? I look at it sadly. Okay, um... So why am I drinking out of this class, looking at it sadly? And 
Um, at this point, most of you are noticing that uh, people are starting to know that they have, um, despite the fact that you're in transit, the Reliant still has systems that need uh, people at their posts, you know, uh, tomorrow. So a lot of the officers that work in the various departments are beginning to file out. It's probably somewhere around 11 in the evening. Marcus will take this opportunity to go to the holodeck. Nice. So he arrives at the holodeck and looks at the keg, looks at the crew, and says, uh, are we all okay? I I haven't touched that stuff. I've been having singularity bombs. Kara has a single set. I'm just the having the then. one. I'm just having the one. All right. I'm, I'm he... going to do a keg stand. <laughs> He takes oh God, the vase don't do from Lieutenant Tardigrade. He he takes the vase from Lieutenant Tardigrade, sort of dips it into the keg, and just starts drinking some Pazra's, uh brew. Careful, and... sir. It's got a kick. Yeah, I was fully informed by Lieutenant Tardigrade, who was he himself born. informed <laughs> by Hazra. So, yeah, he's been letting me know what's in this stuff, and yeah, I just had to try it myself. Hasra really gets around, doesn't he, sir? Yeah, he... Kara looks over at Kendra. Kendra surveys the room and turns to her husband. (sighs) Looks like I might be flying the ship by myself tomorrow. And you know what my piloting skills are like. Don't remind me, sweetie. Please... Kara points over to Oakley. Oakley can't drink, and he's the junior con officer now. Remember, I started training him. Don't worry. Our our XO can't drink right now either, so. I'm going to do a keg stand. I I start walking over to the keg. Kara suddenly grins. She looks over at Oakley. Hey, I just realized, XO, XO officer. You're the XO now, Oakley. Graves gives Kendra and Quentin a little bit of a look there and just sort of looks back to Eli and just sort of gives him the official nod of congratulations on the promotion. And then continues to drink while Lieutenant Tardigrade kind of just is, is just kind of looking at him at this point. Just sort of like, not out of like any fear, but just out of curiosity for what will happen next. Sorry about the replicators, sir. I really thought the pinnacle of Starfleet technology could replicate something Hazra could make. I didn't give Hazra enough credit. You wouldn't be the first to make that mistake. So, yeah, so Graves is just sort of like, he's just sort of like hanging around and sort of finds one of the tables and just sort of like lounges. Okay. Um, again, uh, except for Graves, <clears throat> it's about 11, like I just said, um, about 11 at night, and except for Graves uh, coming in, no one else has come in, but uh, many have uh, many have filtered out at this point. There's only a handful of people that are still there besides any of you. Uh, Well, I'd better go and start repairing some of these incidents with the replicators. Car cries, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Rick just sort of laughs. Your, Your apology is accepted and... Just try not to duplicate hazard stuff again. Lesson learned. He just sort of taps her, taps her on the shoulder and um, starts heading out. Kara goes and sits over next to Marcus quietly and watches the rest of the party as junior officers slowly file out.
Lieutenant Tardigrade looks at the keg, and, and like no, no, like apparently no one else is drunk out of it besides Marcus, and he holds oh, the entire Tara thing up. To I'm trying oh. to. I, I. He holds the entire thing up to Eli. What are you doing? I'm trying to do a keg stand. Why are you holding? I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go upside down on it. It's a keg uh, stand. He, he nods furiously and then sort of sets it down and then sort of takes a step back. Q, we're going to need some twitching. sort of roll here. It, it make, uh, make some sort of constitution roll. Um, so that would be fitness, um, security, or command? I'm going to say fitness, security. Uh, so your target number is 11, and you have no focuses that apply. Hold on a second. I'm just opening up my sheet. So you said it's what? Target number is 11. Fitness plus security. You're very fit, but your security is very low. Can I make this science instead since I'm drinking a concoction? Nope. <laughs> what nope. about command? Command. No, 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 no. No, you no, have to withstand stuck. this. It's physical. I went through it. Now you have to. Ha! Holy crap! <laughs> Eli, get ridiculously drunk. Um, but apparently it affects and, Trill differently or something. Well, what I'm thinking is it just doesn't knock you down. Um, You stumble and uh, you sit rather than fall and Eventually, when you recognize someone, you think it's probably a good idea if you ask them to help you back to you. I don't want to go back to my quarters yet. There's a lot of ensigns in red uniforms gathering around Eli now, chanting, Eli! Eli! <laughs> I, I probably stand probably the not. I, I, oh. I would think probably not. Yeah. Um, most of, as I said, almost everyone except for you guys now is gone. It's late. It's ele- it's post 11 o'clock, um, and, uh, it's really just you guys in there now. Um, and Eli, you basically feel like if someone doesn't help you back to your quarters, you're not going to make it there, and you have no idea what will happen to you. Can I make one more drink? No. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you can make, you can the make DM another... has cut you off. I mean, you can make another drink, but this is like this is going to heavily affect Eli. Um, looks over you have to Oracle Blaster. Come on. Of course, you <laughs> have another drink, and Sir, you we lose consciousness. Woo! Um, Eli, uh, does, Eli does a woo and makes himself another drink out of the replicator. And he downs it very fast, and for a minute, it looks like he's handling it because he handled the drink that happened just before this one. But it looks like that was the last one his body was going to handle because his eyes kind of focus on different things and just kind of wig out for a second, and he falls over half on a cow half on like a a bench seat. <laughs> we should probably help him. Yeah, let's uh let's do that. Um Oakley, once he has she has Oakley's attention. Um you're dismissed. You're off duty right now, so you can you can do whatever. She looks over at Marcus. I don't know if anybody else does it, but when I do the duty sheets, I try to give the exocomps downtime. It just feels, you know, like they should have some. Yep, agreed. And with that, she goes over to Eli. I got this side, you get that side, sir? Yep. Uh, we can look at the quarters. And the night, uh, the night ends with people returning to the quarters. And Actually, we, hold on. Uh, I've got Marcus out in the hallway here for a second, so I think I'm just going to take a quick opportunity. Sir, I think it might be a good idea if you got out to meet with the crew a bit more. 
Even tonight during the party, you showed up even later than I did and then just sat off in a corner. I suppose you have a point. So how about this? How about if we go out and do something fun? Like as a group, maybe you, me, and, I don't know, Eli, once he recovers, it could be part of his celebration for getting a promotion. I suppose. Okay, how about we go fishing? No. F-Zero racing. No. Rafting. Uh, still water themed. Uh, maybe an Arctic expedition? That's more water, just colder. <laughs> A rock concert? Uh, not really my thing. Rock climbing? Uh, not my thing for similar reasons, oddly. Tiki party? A what? Jaharamon? Uh, I don't particularly know what that is. That's okay. That one was just in there to see if you were paying attention. Um, volcano hike. Uh, I presume on the holodeck? Well, yeah. We could try rafting instead. Uh, well, that's back to rafting. Oh, right. Uh, Not volcano hang- rafting. Hang gliding. Uh... Try that once. Also try that once, although not by intention. She looks up at him. Camping? Yeah, I guess. You're not just saying that to get rid of me, are you? She gives him the big, soft, no. sad, ibby eyes. So at this point, he's like, no, no, no. Camping's fine. Used to do that a little bit. Uh, I guess you would say a kid. But, yeah, camping, perfectly fine. Okay, sir. I'll set it up with the holodeck team and everything else. Um, You go get some sleep. I've got a few late-night adjustments to run, and then I'll turn in as well. Uh, Don't forget, we still have to deliver this one to his quarters. Actually, we just did that. I was imagining we were discussing outside his quarters. Oh, I thought we were, like, in transit, like, still holding Eli. I, I was imagining nobody has to see what's in my quarters. Because, but because you uh, stopped us before we got to the quarters, Kara, um, I was imagining the two of you each holding one one arm, with Eli just awkwardly hanging in the air between you while you had that conversation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if everybody that, likes that, that was, that's good with me. <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. What I saw. <laughs> All right, so that's what yeah. happened then. So it was even more uncomfortable. Oh, also, one other thing I'll add to this. So, like, Lieutenant Tardigrade is also following them behind. Uh, Karen, like, he's got the remnants of the keg as a hat, and then he's, like, holding up Eli's legs while they're carrying his arms. All right on. So he also knows they're going camping. That's terrible. All right. Um, we are going to pick up our next scene in the uh, in the morning, and um, uh, Kendra, roll of let, let me let me see Kendra's sheet. Roll fitness plus. Hmm, it's a physical thing, so I'm going to say fitness plus security. Your target number is twelve. And none of your focuses apply. You guys currently have no momentum. He rolled for me because I can't. That's okay. That's that's all good. You've got two successes. Um, or just mm, you're just nauseous and don't feel good this morning. Um, you didn't even drink, so you're not really sure why. Um, you just really don't feel well. Um, uh, breakfast helps a little bit. And um, while you're getting ready, um, Quentin, you can see that um, there's information for the XO and information for you that have come through the uh, – that, that, has come from the 
the, the, the layer of commands that are that are coming down, Kendra. Um, it looks it looks to you like there's uh, some very there's some minor crew transfer happening, um, and on your end, you need to. Um, <laughs> um, so engineering can install it, but um, they need you to isolate the system of something that's going to be uh, being put into engineering by um, when you arrive at K7. Um, you need to use your science to isolate the power system and co uh, and connections that, that talk to your ship in any way of a board regeneration alcove to be placed in sick bay. Couldn't and I just write a? Uh, or, oh, that's her, not me. Oh, that's you. You okay. have to you have to isolate that, yeah. Okay, because can I just word, write a strongly worded um, memorandum about the uh, sudden reduction of the number of probes we're going to have? <laughs> um, you're probably saying that out loud. Uh, he's probably saying that out loud as you come out of you know the bathroom. You guys are in uniform, you're ready. You know you're pretty much ready to start the day. And Kendra. You see that when you arrive at K7, you will, um, it's a it's a number, about a dozen or so minor crew transfer. Um, some people moving on to K7, just new people moving in to take their positions in, in the departments that they work in. But there is... Um, there is one major crew transition that was approved only this morning, um, literally like an hour before these orders are coming down through the vines to everybody, you know, to everybody. Um, Borg, uh, you, you, you see that there is Borg activity in the neutral zone, and um, there is a concentration of uh, there's a concentration of Borg uh, Borg forces that have uh, basically circled onto this one planet known as Otha um, in the neutral zone, and. Larissa is being transferred off of the Reliant uh, and will be going with a ground team to uh, will be going with a ground team to fight the Borg. Um, in, the, in the middle of uh, in the middle of a war with the Klingons, she's basically going to be starship trooper troopers um being dropped onto a, pl a, a planet that is being assimilated by the borg to try to stop whatever they're doing um she is being replaced by um a, a unique starfleet officer um the a, a very unique starfleet officer in fact uh in that um i don't know if there's been a an advanced synthetic life form served in Starfleet since Lieutenant Commander Data. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, there may have been. Well, um, certainly it's not since um, the early uh, 2399s when you know the synth ban and all of that yeah. and um, so burning of cars, yada yada. So you're, you're the, the Reliant, and, and Marcus, you'll be getting all of this information, too. I'm just going to go to, like, each person and, sh and tell them what information their departments are getting and what they're going to need. Um, and uh, you are getting an advanced synthetic life form. He is, uh, he is a Model 2. Is a a model to um, uh, Maddox Series Two. His name is Lieutenant. His name is Bryce. 
That's the only name that he has, and his rank is Lieutenant Junior Grade. Um, he entirely looks like a young version of Bruce Maddox. That's what I put behind the spoiler tags in 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 uh, character info. He in his in his write up in his bio, he entirely looks like a younger version of Bruce Maddox who is wearing a uniform that I dropped at the end, which is that, that's uh, I don't want to say it's Sierra One, but I'm probably wrong. It's one of the Sierras. Uh, it's a very common uniform being worn by officers in the fleet right now. That's what you know, the two of you know, um, going into day two. Um, um, and we're going to go back to these scenes in this order. So first is going to be Quentin and uh, Quentin and Kendra. Um, and then we're going to go to Rick in the morning because, Rick, the thing that you find out in the morning is that your engineering team is responsible for installing a Borg regeneration alcove in sick bay in the sick bay of the reliant well that uh, that does get a eyebrow raise but yeah. in, in, um, in order. uh hara um you actually um are it's not in order, but there is there is a suggestion um, for your ship for the Reliance piloting team to familiarize themselves with the industrial rescue arms that are going to be added to the Reliant via, uh, via simulation time between now and your arrival at K7. Because that's going to fall under the purview of... The, uh, you know the the front two spots on the bridge. It's going to fall under the the ops and and piloting area, and so you're going to be the one making making those roles when it uh, becomes necessary. Because you can see what's going to be added to the reliant, and it's going to be really weird. Um, essentially, there's going to be these three arms under the under on three arms that will be under the saucer and uh starting at the very low end and outside of the deflector that are essentially industrial search and rescue arms so you could you could pull uh with these things you could pull apart a wall and have the third arm pull something out from but at the level of it being the size of a ship. Basically, it's like you have a rescue ship with the jaws of life on it, essentially. Um, and you, you need to be rated on that before things happen. And Dr. O'Connor, you wake up with a terrible hangover. And all of the news that you see on your pad, you probably don't believe it at first. You, you probably think you might not even have read your pad at first because your head hurts really bad um, before I think you probably have coffee. But no, when you when you look at the orders again, um, there's a new doctor coming into sick bay. A, uh, a liberated Borg uh, will be arriving in your sick bay in five days. They're going to be installing an alcove for her. Uh, in your sick bay, uh, her specialty is removal of Borg implants in those who have been rescued, and uh, they, she she's she's the first one that helps in XB. Um, she's the doctor that you know that gets the pieces out of them. She's not a counselor or anything like that, but. You have someone who looks a whole lot like a board that's going to be coming your way. And, of course, Marcus, all of this information comes to you. The addition um, that here on day two, um, there, are, uh, there are listings of a lot of, skirm a lot of skirmishes. Um, you see all of the crew transfers that are going to happen. It's, it's a total of 13 people. It's, it's 12... Uh, 12 lower, you know, 
12 junior officers that are trading out for someone else who is just as good at that, you know, at that job. It's the, it's kind of what happens every time you set into a star base, um, maybe one or two people transfer out um, and someone else transfers in. But um, you also see the information that Larissa is being temporarily, temporarily moved to uh, the ground unit of Starfleet to be sent to a planet that is being assimilated by the Borg in an attempt to stop what they're doing there. And we pick up that second day. There are still, um, if anybody makes it a point to go by the board, like on their way to their shift or something, there are no casualties, um, no ship destructions. Uh, the USS Ride Out reported heavy damage, uh, heavy damage outside of outside of Karat. Uh, after an engagement with Klingon vessel, Klingon warbirds that was broken up by the arrival of a Borg sphere uh, between them. So we pick up um, in the quarters of uh, Kendra and Quentin, just as you both are about to be your day with the information you have. A2. When Kendra sees that Larissa is being transferred, there was an audible no! And now Kendra is in a decidedly grumpy mood. She rather relied on Larissa when she was um, chief of security, and she always feels better knowing that she's there now that now that she's not on the security team anymore. Larissa kind of was her right hand. Kara sits at the bridge at her usual station, looking very tired and disheveled. She's currently pulling up the information on when Oakley will be free so that she and Oakley can both get the training for the grappling arm, since Oakley is her junior con officer. She sighs. I can't believe I had to bathe Nala. I can't believe my dog rolled around in that muck. <laughs> um, Rick, so you know, um, some of what you need to install the, um, uh, to, to install the board regeneration alcove, um, a lot of it you're going to need to pick up at K7 when, uh, the, the main alcove mm. itself and, and such you'll need to get from K7, but there are things that the industrial replicator that you have can produce that, uh, that will get sick bay ready for being the strangest thing you've ever thought of being i mean you know that one of these or a few of these have been on starfleet ships before but never thought you'd serve on one that had an actual board regeneration alcove in it all right well uh, i guess first things first is to go see the doctor to see where we should set this thing up All right, I guess I'm at my desk trying to get a hypo out of a case, trying to in inject myself with a hangover cure. Uh, there, there's the the, uh, the the chime at the door of your office. Um, out the front, Rick T. You can see through the glass. Just before Come you admin, just before you minister the uh, the hangover cure. I, I groan, uh, a, a hungover groan, and just say, come in. Uh, the door wishes open, and uh, Rick steps in. Uh, Take it you received uh, some new orders. Yeah, I'm still just trying to wrap my head around them while trying to get my head back. Wow. Well, uh, we'll need to uh, discuss um, arrangements for our um, new guest, well, new um, doctor aboard, creating her alcove and, uh, sorry, is it, uh, creating their alcove, um, and, and um, essentially getting things as ready as we can before I arrive at K7. Understandable. 
Um, I I just inject myself quick, just like right in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> Shake my head like, okay, much better. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be good uh, over there, like, Sort of not in a corner per se, because that that kind of seems like an asshole move to just put them in a corner. Um, but yeah, right right over there, I point to I point to a place. To, I, I'm not sure it really matters. <laughs> uh, basically, what you find, Rick, is that um, is that you'll have to move one bio bed to the opposing to the opposite wall. And you have more than enough room to set up this, uh, the dimensions of the alcove that you were sent. Yeah, I presume there would be, like, power requirements and all that kind of stuff with it. And, and the, you know, I'd look at the, the current conduits, what can, what is they able to handle it, what, you know, what what is easier to uh, handle. Okay, um... You do see that um, whatever conduits that you, uh, like whatever power conduits you end up using, um, a science team is, uh, they they have basically their mission when you were like, when you arrive at K7, the science team needs to be working on isolating that power system from reliance power systems. Mm-hmm. And the engineering team needs to be, like, when you arrive there, needs to be working on all we need to do is, like, uh, the, 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 the feeling that all of you get from the orders that you've received. And, Marcus, you get this feeling more than anyone else. And that is... Or expected to be mission ready a couple of hours after you arrive. That's everything you see in these orders is telling you that. Uh, those those mission pods are going to be being traded out by um, by shipyard um, by shipyard staff as soon as you arrive at the starbase. Like worker bees are going to like swarm your ship and start doing stuff. Um, all of you get the impression that when you arrive at K7, it's going to be, um, it's going to be very quickly heading into action. So with that, uh, Marcus is going to send a quick note to, uh, Kara and Eli, just a quick like question of, uh, it's actually a very quick message. It's basically camping when question mark signed graves. I, I, I send a message like, what about camping? Just immediately. <clears throat> Graves just types in, oh, you've been shanghai Oh, no. Call it, it's and then like- he sort of, like, adds the supplemental, like, call it a team-building exercise. We're doomed. Okay, um... <laughs> So as uh, uh, when you look into uh, finding, so you aren't the only ones who get the, you know, who who get that heavy feeling of ship changing orders so fast. And Kara, it is, the, it, it will be the middle of tomorrow uh, sometime, uh, call it 10 minutes after noon hour that the hollow deck will be free for one hour's worth of time. Oh, we're going to do overnight camping. Yeah, this was intended to at least start as an overnight thing. Okay. Yeah, so it's basically, Um, it's like, we've got it's going to, like, everything's going to just go nuts later. So what we're basically uh, going to do is just do like a, between day two and day three, of like, between duty, like, at the end of duty shift to the next duty shift. Okay. Camping. It all happens at night. Woo! A scary story must be told. Well, that's all I'm saying. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and that is probably said, you know, on the bridge or something. You know, a scary story must be told. Oakley, I need you to replicate me a flashlight. Um, are we still on duty in the morning, or 
basically every day that passes, you'll have your normal like alpha duty shift. Um, I've uh, my my imagination tells me that most Starfleet ships probably break up into three eight-hour shifts. Um, it's possible and probably in many ways might even be preferable to break the break the duty roster into four six-hour shifts. That's, you know, that's totally up to the command team. But I would say the standard is probably three eight-hour okay. shifts. So I was just wondering where we were in the scene. So if anyone had any ideas for what to do during the day, we could do those, or we could just jump to camping prep. Um, yeah, that's that's all for you guys to decide. Um, none of the things that you have to do are in any way a stress situation right now. Uh, though all of those things, I will allow you to make a roll in an attempt to build momentum. If you get anything more than, you know, like in the, does the engineering team get more than one success while they're installing, you know, the, uh, while they're installing the uh, regeneration alcove, does the science team get more than one success? Does all of those things you guys can try to build momentum on. You don't have to. So question, try. I guess learning to use the arms would be control and probably engineering? Um, let me look. Let me, let me think of what would be... Because if it was control and con, I'm definitely going to crush it. But if it's control and engineering, at least I have a chance to fail. (laughs) Um, Control and con, you're going to crush it. Okay, well, first off, I'm augmented, so I get an automatic success. It's a 16 for you and your your critical number is a 5 because this involves ship flight and piloting. Um, so you can attempt to build uh, build some momentum there if you want. Uh, yeah, total of four successes. <laughs> and you build three momentum. Does anyone else want to roll on the thing that they're doing? Um, Car looks over at Oakley. Car looks over at Oakley. Hey, this is easy. I like this. I wonder if they'll let us put this on the ship all the time. The, uh, the other, um, Oakley is not your only junior con officer. Um, in fact, there is someone who you have noted, Kara, that he seems really put out. He used to say hey to you, like when he would come and sit down for his shift after spending eight hours on, like, the, if Kara goes off the bridge, I take the... Uh, the flight seat. He's um, he's the equivalent of um, I, I I remember telling you that he looked like um, you know that that Star Trek meme where the the black guy at helm is like clutching his head. He looks like that guy in um, in a red suit, and he is um, he's before you just suddenly made Oakley the junior con officer, that was his job. And he definitely is unhappy that you took that job from him with no explanation and no reason. Um, So he doesn't say hello anymore when he comes on for second shift. Um, Can I play this character? (laughs) If you'd like to, sure. Um, the, the idea behind him is that I introduced him once, um, when Kara had to leave the bridge, he moved in and took, um, and, and took the, you know, the flight control seat. And then it became suddenly Oakley was the junior con officer. And this guy was like, so a fucking machine just got promoted into my position and I got removed with no explanation. And so so he doesn't say hello to Kara anymore. Um, That's just what you know, Kara. Um, But when you say, I don't mind these things, he goes, I don't know. They make the front of the ship feel a little little heavy because he's also 
running the same doing the same thing you and Oakley are doing and running simulations at like the auxiliary pilot station off to your right by like ten feet. Like, can we play I the scene? Right? Hold yeah. on. Can we can we play the scene out real quick? Yep. Um, he is finding that's that's what I can tell you uh, for him, Duncan, is that he is finding the front of the ship feeling heavy and cumbersome with these arms on it. Okay, so he, he he's just sort of sitting like at the secondary con station. So they're off on one. So he's just sitting there, pointedly not speaking, not saying anything, but having that particular attitude that just he wants to speak. He has opinions. You know he's got opinions, but he's not saying anything right now. Seems like the left arm is locking up a little. Try to extend the auxiliary positronic invas- inter- invariance and further. Uh, you know that's going to throw off the inertial dampening settings by 0.2 degrees. Oh, that's which not may- this character. I'm I'm really sorry, Duncan. That's just not this character. Um, he's a professional. Well, so, yeah, he is. He's upset. He, is. And he wouldn't sit there totally silent. Um, this is part of his job, and like what he and Kara and Oakley are training to do is important and he knows that he wouldn't sit there stewing in his anger about it he would he's mention- not stewing in his anger he's got opinions about the situation not necessarily about the specific but he thing wouldn't he's doing himself he wouldn't keep them to himself this man is a starfleet professor i was That's just going through that like, I'm, I'm just speaking I, as a correction. I'd like, I'd like to some. T- I, I just really want to play this NPC. Okay. I did. I did introduce him some time ago, and okay, go um, for it. All, all, all he says it, when Kara says, um, "I wouldn't mind these things being on the ship all the time," is that he uh, he turns over to where uh, where you and Oakley are at the simulator, and he says, "He says it's making the front of the ship feel heavy, like uh, like it wants to bow, to like it wants to bow." Would, what are you? What are we gonna do? That you know, and he's he's basically saying this is what he's seeing as a problem. What do the three of you want to do to solve that problem? I think we can just extend the auxiliary positronic invariance inhibitor, and it should even out. He makes a few. He makes a few adjustments and uh, and nods from his simulator. He, not a you know, not smiling or anything, and not like pointedly, um, not like smiling. He nods. Um, he obviously makes the adjustment you just um, you just suggested. And did you seriously just use a babble? Um, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, you're doing a good job over there. I think we'll have this set up no matter what happens. I think with my security training, I might get sent down to the planet. Probably going to be up to you and Oakley to handle everything from here. You're capable of it, right? You look at the mission orders again, and you realize there's no planet involved with where you're going. There's a big mining, op- big mining operation on moons, and um, yeah. Okay, let me rephrase that then. Yeah. <laughs> As a senior officer with security specialization, I might get called away, so it might be up to you and Oakley to handle everything. You're okay with that, right? He nods. Okay, glad to hear it. I know everybody on my team is capable. I have complete faith in you. She is oblivious, by the way. Completely oblivious. Oh, I love that because um, his response to, like, you being oblivious is just, it's not an eye roll. It's more of a, how do you not understand you know why I'm kind of mad, and he continues running his um. He continues running the uh, simulation to, you know, to be doing what he's doing. You have built three momentum for the group. Um, does anyone else want? We to have built to... three momentum. Technically, all three of us were doing that simulation. That's true. It's still a lot of momentum built. Uh, Rick will will do a row. Okay, for you, that's going to be engineering and ooh, reason, probably. You think that's that sounds right? 
Uh, regional control, um, whatever you think is more appropriate. I'm going to say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this is something you have to reason out. Um, reason and engineering, gosh, it's a 16. Um, what is EPS power systems? So that that's one of my focuses. So if it's, it's if it's to do with something to managing the the power systems, it's it's it. I get um, my expanded range crit range. So sixteen is your target number, and your crit five. range is five. Mm-hmm. Did you get? I'm not there. Three successes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Quentin, do you want to try to roll for the science? Sure. And after that, let's get um, what Kendra is doing. Do it. what target number am I looking for? Oh, oh, I should I should actually have your right in front of me. Um, you are going to be rolling for sciencing it, and also reason. Um. You do not have the you do not have a focus in it, but you have a fifteen uh is your target number. Two. You guys have maximum amount of momentum going into the scenes that follow toward the end of uh day two as uh some of you want to as some of you will be entering into the hollow deck. Um, to get to know each other a little bit, and um, all of you will uh, will feel um, the tension on the ship is has has risen, and I'm I'm sure that the, the counselor would let you know that too. And Kendra, what's going on uh, for Kendra now? Well, both habits die hard, and as former. Chief of Security, Kendra immediately starts doing background checks on the two main crew transfers. Not your typical computer inquiries, but using some channels that she has from her background. Can I do a roll? Oh, absolutely. I really like it. Um, Because I Thinking about your background, I'm like, yeah, I, I really like that. I'm going to say this could be, um, doesn't have to be reason. I think um, using other channels. Are you trying to, um, try, and somebody says, you know, like, uh, basically, what is your attitude on the approach to? getting the information is it um presenting yourself as like like with with your presence or it, it, it's kind of presence or daring is is what you're what you're in it's presence or daring and command um so I'm it's either a, presence command okay so it's a 14 and you do have persuasion so i'm going to let persuasion apply 14 is your target number and Four is your critical number. Is that another cast roll there? Yeah, he, oh. he rolled for me. Yep. You, you guys, uh, you guys are sitting at uh, maximum amount of momentum going into uh, going into the night of day two, going into day three. But what do you want to find out? And that kind of success, what you found out um, on the background of uh, which of the two specifically, um, it'll take more searching. To, uh, the best information you find that you'll certainly be, you, you'll, you find that the best information you will find about the Maddox series, uh, uh, about Bryce, Will come from st- from his Starfleet record, um, and his uh, they he it's basically the equivalent of a birth certificate. He has something that he calls a uh, that is called a creation record. Of uh, you, he's part of a line of five five sentient um, 
I've sent in androids that all look the same. Um, and the, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I was moving my chip bag actually away. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, uh, so, so his information is super easy to find, but with three successes, you uh, are able to find out about the doctor at, um, because of, uh, the doctor has uh, refused treatment for her left side ocular implant Let's call it uh, six times. She she has refused having the left side ocular implant and uh, and scanner removed because that is directly connected to a, a large a large information cache she isn't even really able to access but it's the it's the medical information that comes and this is all this is all what you have to do a little bit of digging in order to get deeper background information from um the Daystrom Institute and that is that she has ton of medical knowledge in the systems if you look at the picture that that i posted of her before she's got one of those really gigantic borg implants on the side of her face and you know from what you've been able to dig up that goes really deep uh it would be that you're it's one of those things that's so deeply um like plugged into her own brain that it would be dangerous to try it's certainly dangerous to try to remove it though not impossible but she has refused potential treatment for it six times that's the only odd thing um oh. that you find about her can i since, since i got three successes can can hmm. i I would have also been looking for um, sort of like their character and personality. Character. I would be I'd be trying to seal them out before I even get to know them. So to so show like I'd be okay. not just um, official channels, but people that would have known the two them. Two more successes. It's like you could send them as soon as you roll them, as if they had been momentum. So character and personality on Doctor Three. Um, Correct, um, unemotional, uh, focused, and or you, you, the, the 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 read that you get from other people is that. Um, Some some people think she might not be happy having been removed from a collective, but that is a life that she leads. Is has been is that she has been removed from the collective. Um, a great deal of nanites still flood her system. I mean, she does not look very human at all. looks more like a board drone um as far as bryce bryce loves being a sentient an, an advanced synthetic life form uh the uh, personality that you get from uh from people is that he is not an android who is looking to be human. Um, he is an android who is looking to serve Starfleet as an android um, to show that they, you know, it's based, basically it seems like this series, this model of, uh, this model of synth 
as um, all five of them are in uh, some sort of galactic type service, um, the way that um, Bryce is a part of Starfleet. Uh, it's almost like they want there seems to be a very a common theme between them that this series of this series of synth wants to move to Starfleet at um what happened on Mars all those years ago uh was not was not who they are and that they are more it's basically his journey is different than data's but in some ways kind of similar um but he doesn't uh, personality wise he doesn't have a pinocchio complex he's not looking to become more human he's simply looking to prove that his people aren't aren't genocidal maniacs if that makes sense so he like wants to prove his worth and the worth of his race as their own entity Yes. Aside from humans. Exactly. Okay. He, he he thinks of the scent, like, you can even see it in probably, um, like, reports from instructors at the academy and such, that um, his, his general approach seems to be that um, his nature as a synthetic being is no different than a Vulcan's nature as a Vulcan or an Andorian's nature as an Andorian. He is a synthetic. That's what he is. That's uh, th- that, that's what you that's what you get on the two of them. Um, so, did I uncover any like personal stories that were shared about? Um, I don't know what the Borg lady's name is, but uh, Doctor Three. Um, Doctor Three works and then regenerates and has. Only in two years at the Daystrom Institute, um, managed a passing friendship with one tech, uh, with with just a a tech who works on the project. Um, Does not have, does not have friends, has work, um, is, is what you get from works and she regenerates. Got it. Okay. Um so we move toward the evening and um the holodeck um the, the holodeck we will say has time for you to do um to do a very long um go into the wilderness camp and um you know, go into the wilderness camp and um at uh at a night where you get to, you know, where you get to spend time in nature. The holodeck is certainly um the holodeck is certainly able to do that. So uh so well one of you let let me let us know uh what the holodeck is like when whoever is going into it goes into it. So I think it'll be good if all three of us are you know, like Connor, Kara, actually and Lieutenant Tardigrade are just sort of like sitting kinda standing kind of awkwardly right at the foyer while Kara is inputting the settings for the program. Eli will explain his costume. Uh, Graves is just sort of in generalized rec wear, and Lieutenant Tardigrade is, uh, is still in his uniform. The gun belt is also on. <laughs> Gotta explain it for the listeners. Okay, so I... Let's just put a picture in there somewhere, but I, I used Red Dead Redemption to make a camping outfit. Nice, nice vest, some jeans, gun belt with a bunch of trinkets on it, including a compass and a little frying pan. Some scissors. And the hat. And and a nice hat. It is a very nice hat. We'll, we'll include the picture. Don't worry. Maybe. Hopefully. Okay. Kara is wearing a leather vest over a white long sleeve shirt and also has brown pants on. 
around her belt, she has less stuff than Eli has, but she does have a hatchet trimmed in bright neon green. She looks over at the holodeck, you know, gritting. Computer, activate program CIO 317. Pull additional data from the present officer's files. That includes Dr. Eli O'Connor, Captain Marcus Graves, uh, Security Officer John Tardigrade, and Con Officer Kara Junrani. The computer complies, and it pulls up what looks to be the path down into a, you know, pine tree surrounded camp area with mountains surrounding a small valley. And it also pulls up a small little hut, which says guide on the front and has a Cardassian staffing it. Graves approaches and just sort of like, hey, uh, and just sort of does this sort of like generalized like wave, like howdy there to the Cardassian. I look at him like, oh, crap, I didn't realize that uh, that he'd be coming along. That's a, uh, that's my hollow pen pal. Or, that's, it's difficult to describe. <laughs> Graves is sort of stopped dead and still an arm in the air. He sort of turns his, turns to Eli, recognizing who the Cardassian is and having a little bit of a shock that he didn't expect to see this person here because Marcus worked with a lot of people in his past life and some of them were quite scary. This was one of the most scary. So he just says to Eli, your pen pals with Elam Garrick. Garrick? She looks it's back and long... forth. It's she looks back and forth between the Cardassian and Eli. Isn't he a member of the Tatapa Council now? Yes, but okay, it's a it's a long story. So, uh, my my father knows Bashir and uh, or Julian Bashir, um, and then I. I when I got got into medical stuff, uh, my father introduced me to him. But when I start, long story short, um, he's responsible for getting me into capes. I see. We so, like things start clicking in Graves' brain. So I had the computer rebuild the file with people we know, and it decided to choose for you, Elam Garrick, who is now a tour guide. On the holiday. It would seem it would seem so. Um do we want to reset or do we just go on with this? I, 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 I mean, I it's clear the computer I, knows more about Eli than either you or I did, Captain. Do we I don't know what was in Lieutenant Tardigrade's file though. And Lieutenant like I Lieutenant Tardigrade's like he he's sort of like like he's just exploring sort of off in the wilderness and he's not like within immediate earshot. Captain, it's the holodeck. How dangerous could it be? We're perfectly safe here. He chooses not to answer that. <laughs> so he he goes over and Q can uh, play through Derek. Um, he just goes over and it's like, hello there. We're, we're looking for a camping spot. Where are you? Like, where in the universe are are, are I'm I'm sure, I'm sure I'll go ahead and if the computer is using Garrick here. I'll be able to direct you. So, I'm just so kind of, yeah. any of you who want to, you know, who want to a uh, Garrick directing you, that you know, that's totally cool by me. Um, I will uh, in just a little, just a little tiny bit, let Kendra and Quentin and Rick Tier know. Um, what what they will see at the end of the day while the rest of you are in the uh, while the rest of you are in the holodeck. Just to give a quick background, it's basically just somewhere on Ifar, so the trees are a slightly different color, more bluish than greenish. But it's basically a pine forest you could find anywhere on Terra. So, you know, the path leads down to a campsite further down. The tour guide thing is really just there for flavor. Let's just say Kara has just explained all of that to the rest of the crew and sort of grave stopping. And so it's like, yep, um, okay. Uh, he, he waves at Garrick, and Gra uh, Garrick sort of gives back this, like, robotic, like, hello there, fellow pilgrim. Like, it, it doesn't have, like, the full personality yet, or at least 
not integrated with Wani. It's like in that full tour guide persona. So he just you know, starts motioning down towards the campsite and sort of like calls for Lieutenant Tardigrade and sort of scampers up like a little puppy. Kara follows along and leaves Eli to talk with the hologram Garrick if he wants. So, uh, been a while. Hello. You know, you never write anymore quite as much as you used to. What are you so busy with these days? Uh, oh, you know, the academy, doctoring. It's been a while. It's only been like seven months. I don't know. Oh, I was going to write to you about uh, about my uh, my dashing escapade in uh, Onriza, winning a, a ship for myself. You'll definitely have to meet me later to tell me about that. But doctoring? The Cardassian raises his eyebrows and looks at you. Is this anything like Dr. Bashir's form of doctoring? Um, it's definitely not frontier medicine. That's good, because I think Dr. Bashir was not so good at the do-no-harm portion of the Hippocratic Oath. The Cardassian smiles. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm all of that. You should know. I'm a pacifist. I guess you're still bloated in the files. Everyone is a pacifist until life forces them to pick up a gun. Anyway, your friends have moved on. I'll come find you later, and you can dictate, I suppose, the letter you were going to send. All right. As, um, as Eli... Am I... Am I... I'm probably... <laughs> oh, I'm not muted. Wow, okay. Um, uh, you were a very good Garrick. Um, as Eli moves away, um, and... Eric becomes part of the holographic background and the, the, the scenery begins to shift around the three of you. Um, pretty certain that there are uh, glowing, there, 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 there are two glowing orbs of light back in the trees and um, back on the bridge, um, the shift is ending and well, I mean, the, the shift is over and, and, are kind of uh, the 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 three of you who didn't go to the holodeck, Rick and uh, Quentin and Kendra. You're 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 doing the last things you knew, need to do to um, you know get get shift fully traded over. And um, Kendra, you're the only one who gets a notification of it because you're at the command console. But the um, casualty board. Um, or the casualty list from uh, the neutral zone has been uh, has been updated at the end of the day. Uh, there are uh, there are seventy two dead and seventeen missing Starfleet officers and one ship, the USS. USS Pearl. Yeah, the USS Pearl. Um, was destroyed in action. It was a medical ship. That's uh, all of the people were um, that, that were listed in the report are from that ship. And you you see that at the end of the day, and you you realize the rest of the crew is going to see that on the board when they start looking. Um, uh, that's that's what the three of you on the bridge get to see. Anyone near Kendra probably heard the sharp intake of breath when she saw the list come up. If they were looking closely, they probably also noticed her holding back tears. No, Rick, you're both on the bridge, too. Sorry, I had myself muted. I want to run uh, see if Rick actually notices, because he's... He's very smart and capable, but he is like inside. He's is is not used to dealing with people. They say sometimes he's too far in his own head to, to yeah. realize other people. Yeah. Uh, so what's his like inside 10. security? That would be inside eleven. 
Oh, it didn't recognize it. You oh, messed no, it up. I, I, I totally stuffed up the, the command to do it. <laughs> and no, I don't know. And, and complications. Yeah, um, so would it be a similar role for me? or Because I, I would be... Sort of, I think Quentin would probably notice. Unless yeah, but, but Quentin, Quentin's been working on um, isolating triple redundant... Uh, Org powers, data, data data systems, and making sure that there's a uh, mini reactor powerful enough to uh, <laughs> regenerate a Borg. Uh... When he's focused, he's several planets away. Okay, make a roll, Ben. Um, but I also have a complication um, that, that's going to happen because Rick didn't notice. Oh, Rick gets a complication. What do you think is going to happen if I don't? I know, right? <laughs> what, what, that, by the way, what, what's my target? Do we have a target for me? Oh, yeah. Uh, what What was the role, Rick? It was... Uh, Insight security. Insight security. Um, which on you... Let me let me go to the drive and, and, and get Quentin's character sheet popped open. Uh, for you, Insight Security is 11 and 2, so 13. Also keep in mind that I'm already in a really bad mood. Right. Quentin, you do notice. Um, oh, thank God. Rick doesn't. Um, you you can see as like the three of you are 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 heading off of shift that Rick doesn't notice um at all but um yeah I'm I'm okay with that there's a complication uh and that complication is that um you, Rick you were very very focused on certain like locking down certain parts of the work and assigning certain jobs for the evening and Something might have gotten messed up there in that time. Um, uh, you're, you're not aware of anything you did wrong, however. How's that? <laughs> uh, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> um, Probably just uh, thinking out too, too, uh, too fast, actually, you know, um, to, uh, to sort of censor. You know, like yeah. sort of double check and. Um, I imagine we would see a scene because the uh, because the mood on the ship has grown heavy. I I, I would guess that we would certainly see, um, just you know, Nord isn't here, but we would certainly see a scene with Chaplain Waitley um, reacting to the the shift of the mood on board, and. Um, uh, after that, we are um, we are finding ourselves back in the hollow deck, and the uh, um, all that uh, all that is happening um, in terms of the hollow deck working is it's working as it should. Um, the scene is uh, the scene is shifting, and the background uh, the background holograms are doing every everything is working. It seems like you are in a nice. To camp. Graves is going to make a roll to set up the tent or his okay. tent. Okay. Kara watches. So, what would I need to roll to set up a tent? Oh, oh, Have you never, if, if, having never set up a tent before, um, what do you think, Baz? Um, having never set up a tent before, I'm going to guess. Let's, uh, let's say inside engineering because it's not a knowledge thing. It's a it's a it's a um, do yeah, I know enough to 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 intuit the situation I find myself in? I think so. Inside engineering is uh, your target number is ten. Uh, no special critical range. <laughs> um. Kara, you see Marcus set his tent up fast and efficiently. <laughs> I got a critical. Kara actually lets loose a bit of applause, goes over, side hugs the captain. Very well done, sir. Now I'll set up mine. She walks over, 
sits down the auto-unfolding tent, presses the button, and stands back while her tent unfolds and sets itself up. And we've got Eli's accommodations. Okay, what are you, I'm gonna, you gonna sleep in, Eli? I, I got a, I got something to go with my my cowboy shelf. It. I, I I'm setting up an old western tent, like an A-frame. Okay. And I've done this before, so. A-frame's awesome. Uh, in fact, that's that's my um. Kind of like personally my favorite kind of tent. Um, Same. Yeah, I like those. Um, yeah, I don't think you necessarily have to roll to to set up a, a simple A-frame. Um, so you guys have your camp set up, and uh, Lieutenant Tardigrade digs a small burrow for himself. Right on. And is like is, we're all sitting around the campfire, and he's just sort of like poking out a little bit. And just sort of staring at the fire very intently. Kara, meanwhile, gathers up some sticks, hands out the sticks, and pulls out some marshmallows along with some graham crackers and some chocolate bars. I hear that this is an old earth tradition. My parents taught me when I was young, and I really like these things. They're called s'mores. S'mores, you say? I, I know what s'mores are. Graves was raised mostly on a ship, and his camping experience includes getting lost in the woods. So he he's sort of like, this is sort of like he's abused is his total reaction here. Well, since Eli's so sure of himself, Kara sits down between Marcus and John and shows them how to toast a marshmallow and then put it on a piece of chocolate with the graham crackers around it and shows them how nice and wonderful the s'more is. <laughs> Lieutenant Hargrade, like he 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 he's eating, but he's very quiet. You so, okay, Tardy? He he just sort of nods, and sort of leaves it at that, and uh, sort of Graves sort of does that sort of like he's sitting down, then sort of does that lean back, look up, sort of angles himself back on his arms, and basically says, "So team building exercise." Yeah, I mean, I figured it'd be great. I'm probably the first Ibby you've ever met, right? Uh, actually, no. Really? Yeah, I've been to Ifr. Wow, you've been to Ifr? I. You, okay. Um. Did, did you know my parents used to be administrators? Uh, admins? No, I. I no, your file said uh, said that. So yeah, I I saw. So, um. Yeah, how was that growing up? Less exciting than you'd probably think. I mean, my parents had already retired pretty much by the time they had me, so they just they contacted the Kijoji family and they set up a small farm. So all I really know is farming. But my parents have taught me about, you know, history and politics. You know, it's not really ever going to be my kind of thing because, you know, I wasn't born an administrator, but it's good to know just the same. You said Kijoji. Yeah, they're the, one of the. They they basically control almost everything edible on Ifar. They've run pretty much all the, all the farms and everything. They've uh, become one of the most powerful families over the centuries. Interesting that they would yeah have that kind of relationship with an admin, but yeah, I guess it's only natural. So yeah, um, uh, when was the last time you were on Ifar? Not not since I came to the academy, really. I mean, yeah, I I miss everything there. My old sheep. I bet Hazel's dead by now. I guess I should write mom and find out. Uh, so I just wanted to bring up the key point. Yeah, we could do a roll at this point. So Eli and Party can make a roll for an inside security check for something. I presume our uh, GM's microphone is gone, so that was a message in chat. No, no, I was just, I didn't want to interrupt the role play, so I was just typing the roles that could be made into chat. Okay, um, okay. I just didn't, I didn't want to interrupt, so um, my mic is there, I was just finishing typing them in. 
So, uh, Tardy's target number? Uh, Tardy's was seven and five, eight and five, so 13. I got two successes. Tardy has one. Don't worry, I'll fill him in if he if he misses something. Oh, like he 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 got a success. Okay, so um, with one success, Tardy, um, there's something in the woods. Um, it, there's no sound. There's just light out in the woods. And um, yeah. Um, Kara just also supposed in chat. Uh, Marcus and Kara don't roll, so yeah, it, they they don't have to. Um, the yeah, I put down there if they want to, they can. But uh, if you do, I'm going to apply threat because you're you know, you're talking to each other. Um, yeah. And, um, and Eli, same direction that Tardy sees this light off in the woods. No, you're nobody but you sees this. I want you to imagine, um, have you ever heard of uh, the Vermont um, Puppet Festival, where they make 20 and 30 foot tall puppets that people walk around on the mountainside? Bed and Puppet. Bed and Puppet. No, but now theater. I'm scared. <laughs> um, out in the woods are these 15, 20 foot tall spindly creatures that uh, just seem to be made out of some kind of white glowing light and you would almost swear that they are dancing. So, Marcus I, uh, and... <laughs> so I, Mark, I stand up. Sorry. No, no, go for it, go for it. I stand up a hand. I just want to mention, since I am wearing the gun belt, he does have like a, he has an air sock pistol in the gun belt. Just why not? Right. He puts a hand on it, trying to intimidate it. Like, who the hell is out there? Uh, does it look like a, uh, well, what's the best way to put this? If our life can be a little bit weird. Does it look like a transparent lobster hanging upside down from a tree? Oh. No. No. <laughs> Uh, what about oh, a small think, oh, little... I, I, what is, what did Quentin just put in there? No, um, it does not look like that. <laughs> we're not, yeah, we're not going that way yet. Uh, that's the season finale. <laughs> um, Lieutenant Targaryen, meanwhile, just runs. He just runs into the wilderness. He just... Targaryen, no! And, and there's just nothing. He's just, he's just gone. And sort of um, Marcus just wa sort of waves like, yeah, it's fine. Marcus is like, sure, that that's all good. Tardigrade gets out into the woods as Eli is like, Tardigrade, no! And um, Tardigrade, you reach the area where what seems like is happening is five uh, creatures that are they, they are humanoid old. <laughs> um, they're too they're too tall and stretchy. There you go. Kara just put it in chat. They're humanoid old. They're too tall and stretchy. They just appear to be these giant white glowing figures made out of light that have um, up near the top of them kind of pockets of blackness that sort of remind you of eyes. And as Tardigrade gets out there, they, um, they are dancing and they finish this kind of circle that they were doing um, and all of those black pools of light, or uh, black pools within the light, you know, all of their eyes turn to look at Tardigrade. And it's it's like the eeriest thing because they all do it at the exact same moment. And then they kind of dissipate into the moonlight around them. May I jump in for one quick thing here then? I was going to bring Garrick back, if that's okay. Um, if you'd like to, uh, the holodeck has started to malfunction, however. Yes. <laughs> we, need Gar we need to bring Garrick over to where we are right now. For oh, that's totally fine. That is the situation you guys find yourself in. So um, These weird creatures just appeared. 
Garrick yep. actually comes down to the camp and noticing that Kara and Graves are busy chatting about this and that, he motions to Eli. Eli, I need to talk to you. Uh, okay, um, let's walk and talk. Let's see where Tardigrade went. Or is this too important? Fine, we'll, we'll try to find him as we go. But look, it's important. Just You lead the way. I'll follow and I'll try to fill you in as we go. All right, I start walking. By the way, I'm wearing spurs, too. I'm going full out with, like, whatever costumes I do, so the, the, the bringing of spurs as I walk. As they walk along, Elam starts to talk, and he gets out at least this far before we go back to looking at anyone else. He says, there's a, there's a, there's a problem, Eli. I feel strange. I think it might be best if you try to get off the holodeck as soon as possible. Oh, okay. I'll try to let everyone else know. Okay. Um, I think it might be best if you try to get off of the hollow deck as soon as possible. At that moment, her friend Garrick lifts up into the air. Um, something has um, something has come through his middle from behind him, um, and um, it, uh, it picks him up. And this this creature has uh, I think um, how how would I best describe it? I, I've got images thanks to Kara. Um, is uh, how how tall is it though? Like, I'm I would imagine like it's, thirteen feet. It's. I was it's gonna big. say twelve. I was gonna say twelve or thirteen feet tall, as um it lifts Garrick off of the ground with these um with these claws, and you see its face, Eli. Um, except it's not a face. It's like um a, a ram skull or something over blackness. Um, and, um, yeah, he, uh, he doesn't even, he doesn't scream because it's kind of that moment of, sh like, absolute shocked silence as that literally happens right in front of you and in your mind... Um, you can hear, um, in your mind, you can hear your, uh, you can hear your sister's, uh, voices telling you that, um, everything is going to be okay. Hear your older sister's voices telling you that everything is going to be okay. Um. Is it in unison, like, since they're twins? Just... Yes, it is in unison. Um, and it, it, you see Garrick in the claws of this creature out in the woods. You're like a good, you know, you're you're good as in yard. You know, you're some yards away from where Kara and Marcus are now, and you were approaching Tardy when this happened. So Tardigrade um, becomes aware that the presence is. Like the the presence of those creatures that were just around him are gone, but something was coming through the woods, and now there's another very big something right there in the woods. Is it fuzzy? No, it's not fuzzy. Not really. It's kind of bloody and leathery skin, and um, thing the the thing that happens is that when you turn around, um. I mean, Eli, you see it do this, too, with Garrick still suspended on its claw. It looks back at Tardigrade. And um, so Tardigrade is smarter and, and, and sentient where a lot of his brethren in the mycelial realm are not, correct? Um, he's on the higher end of the spectrum, but it's, the, the, the other tardigrades are probably, kind of but yeah, he's, 
but, but he's he the is, one who is most adapted to civilization. And he's the one on the highest end of the spectrum. Um, um, you, you hear a tardigrade can almost hear through like every, I would say every pore in his body, but he's a, you know, he, he's a tardigrade. Um, so like everywhere that he can feel and hear something like echoing through his mind, it feels like the mycelial realm is, um, it's both scaring and it's both scaring and comforting at the same time. It feels almost like, um, like what you call home has a voice of its own. You already knew that on some level, but you think that what you're hearing right now might actually be the voice of, of the place you call home. And, um, it's both tempting and, um, and fear inducing because it is uh it is encouraging you to leave your friends behind um because your home is not here your home will always be the the mycelial realm it it it's it, it, doesn't hear voices and suddenly he's hearing voices so at this point though he like he has that like gut reaction like no, because it's that whole thing of like leave your friends behind. It strikes a really deep chord with Lieutenant Tardigrade because he's got that little something in him. He doesn't want to be left alone again. So okay. he immediately spins and looks for the others because he has that. It's not necessarily that he's thinking through this, but he's basically like when he gets that reaction. It just triggers him to then so go like I need to find my friends right now, and it's just that 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 pivot on that core fear that he has that now more than ever he wants to find friends or find that answer that that companionship. If I may, real quick, Q. Yeah. <laughs> While still holding Garrick, the creature waves a paw towards, you know, Tardigrade, who turns to look at it. And from Tardigrade's point of view, the forest seems to expand and close in around him, cutting off access to where Eli and the creature and the stricken Garrick are. A voice whispers silently into his mind, you will be fine. That's kind of what's happening to it, it, because Kara and Marcus are not out in the woods. They're not experiencing this um, this creature in uh, a hollow deck who's getting just a little bit um, too much power um, shunted to it because. The chief engineer was kind of in a in a hurry to double check. Oh, don't tell us yet. <laughs> um, it's it's very obvious that the um, that the safeties are turned off. Um, once uh, for Eli anyway. The rest of you may not notice it, but Eli, um, unless the program is designed to kill like for holograms to kill each other, which you somehow doubt that you know camping. Um, was designed with um, monsters that kill each other. Um, it could be really hardcore think, camping. Um, the um, and the last thing that um that you have to respond to, Eli, is um, Garrick's last word. Uh, Garrick's last four words. Um, at this this holographic version of your friend looking down at you saying, get off the hollow deck. Okay, so can I react to this? Yep. I wish to draw the the little revolver from the revolver from my gun belt. Just fire a plastic pellet at it as I run away. Okay. <laughs> um, screaming. So you know, I want people to hear. I'm, I'm screaming. Running away screaming, so Marcus and Kara will hear that. But while you're screaming, 
in your um, in your mind, um, you can hear your sister's voices um, growing. Uh, as you turn to run away from where the creature is, you um, you hear your uh, you, you hear your sister's voices um, less as you can hear your father's voice telling you that this is exactly what he would have expected from you. To run away and leave your friends to die in the woods. I just keep running. I'm ignoring it. Like okay, you're just like you're just ignoring it. Really, and and here's the thing about what this, uh, what what, what is happening. It it feels like um, it it sounds rather like the people that are. You know, this really sounds like your father. Um, and I don't know the tones of voice that, like, Eli's father would use to tell him that, um, that, you know, this is what he would expect, that he would expect you to, you know, run away when things got tough, when things around you broke and all of this stuff. Um if you look back, it is looking at you, and you could almost swear it's smiling under that under that ram skull on its face as it brings um, the the body of Hollow Garrick up underneath that, like j- just like up to where its mouth would be, and you turn away just before you see it start to eat Garrick. Kara jumps to her feet and looks over at Marcus. Look, it's fun and all to discuss. Oh, here, here it's fun and all to discuss Vinaroga and Otar and all the houses and everything, but um, that was Eli. Uh, yeah, we should probably go check on him. And also, I'm pretty sure they might have heard the the gun firing off since it's like a gas powered one. <laughs> yeah. Do you think he ran into some sort of? I don't know. I don't know, bear? Kara well, draws her little hatchet kind of warily. Uh, Marcus just kind of looks down, realizes he doesn't have anything with him because it was a holographic camping trip. So he kind of looks through, tries to find if he's got anything. And he's got a small stove. And hmm. he, he thinks like, this isn't necessarily something I can throw. So he just basically looks around like he's got a he sort of like takes a he looks to his tent and just sort of pulls up one of the stakes holding it down. He's like, yeah, good enough for holodeck. Kara starts moving off into the forest, making sure that Graves is right behind her. Always be prepared, sir. You're going camping. Make sure you bring survival gear. Noted for next time. But there shouldn't be anything dangerous out here, so I don't know why he would be screaming like that. Uh, it depends on what else was in the holodeck files. Well, it was only supposed to pull stuff from our files that we would find interesting and comforting. That's what the program was designed to do. But you didn't necessarily factor in the Zen tournament. Kara stops dead. Wait a minute. Yeah. He's What would the computer make? He's not He's not humanoid. Well, yeah, so he's not necess- you're not necessarily going to get linear relationships. Here, let me go check for one more thing. So, I'm going to go look through Eli's tent. And I have received some special information. Eli's tent has a iron frying pan. Graves also takes out How, else- <laughs> How else were we supposed to cook? I mean, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, cast iron frying pan is, yeah, life. So, yeah, he takes out his buffs. He's got those two things. He's got a small shield and a small sword in the form of a tent stake. So they, they I, sort of go back up the path. They're sort of entering into the clearing. So the um, they're probably getting in visual range of something, right? They're in visual range of Eli running towards you. He looks terrified. Hey, hey, hey Eli, 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 what's going on here? 
Yeah, giant thing, it just did, it, it ram skull, it, it, it took Garrick, oh god, I, tar, Tardigate, I don't know where he went, it, it, it might eat Garrick, oh god. Yeah, just, Graves. I'm still, Graves, like, clutching the gun. Graves taps his comp badge, uh, or just says, computer and program. Error. Yeah. The program does not end. It, it flickers for a moment. And then it seems to be drawing power from. It's still drawing power. The 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 holodeck is still on. So ta uh, Graves taps his combat. Uh, Mark uh, Graves the bridge. Um, on the on the bridge on the we'll we'll say on the the second shift you have um, ensign. Someone give them a last name. And sin caring. And sin caring. A A R I N G. And sin caring. Um. I want to pick a number between one and six. Four. 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 Oh, we picked the same number. It's really wild. For I, I said to myself, odds are, um, odds it's a male, evens it's female. Um, Ensign Caring is serving um, her shift on the bridge when you call, and you get a uh, bridge here, Captain. We've got an emergency on the holodeck. It's not shutting off. Cut power immediately. Uh, sending. Uh, uh, we're on it, sir. Um, Rick, you get a. Um, you're you're you are just off shift, and you get a ping. Um, a ping on your communicator. You're like, you probably had set it down on the table in your quarters when you get a ping. Um, uh, bridge, uh, bridge to Chief Engineer Rick Tier. Uh, he sort of looked puzzledly for a moment, then taps it. Rick Tier, go ahead, Bridge. Uh, we've got a, we've got a power flow. Heading down to the hollow deck that we can't get turned off, sir. I don't even really know exactly where it's coming from, but it looks like um, it's bleed off power from some of those new systems you guys have been installing. All right, so we'll be on it. Um, I'll be on it. Uh, my engineering team will be on it. That is what he says. Um, uh, my engineering Rick, team will, will be on it. <laughs> uh, me and my engineering team will be on it. Uh, Rick here out. Uh, so he, he taps his, uh, gets Oakley, and add, uh, Rick here to Oakley. Uh, I need you down at the in holodeck. Uh, we've got some power flow issues that I'll need your help with. And then he contacts a few other. Um, few other of his engineering personnel. So as Rick contacts some of his engineering personnel, Kendra and Quentin are, um, you have just gotten all of your work clothes off. You've set down your communicators who are finally able to relax when Quentin's combat goes off. Reynolds here. Uh, uh, sir, we've got a um, we've got a problem with the power flow out of some of the systems as um, as relates to the main hollow deck. Um, we've, we we've got power overflow, and we're going to need um, we're going to need to probably going to need your help to shut that down, sir. Have you reconfigured the primary power conduits? <laughs> Did you just babble? Um, uh, this is a great time for a commercial break. Um, uh, have you reconfigured the primary power conduits? And um, the person that is currently working the problem as like Rick and the, the team that he picked out are getting there goes, um, that was the first thing I tried, sir. Um, it, it looks 
I'm, it just looks like a really heavy power bleed. Understood. I'm on my way momentarily. And um, even probably um, she woke up today feeling grumpy and unhappy. And now at the end of her day, um, Quentin is uh, uh, Quentin is being called back to root to work. Um, and we cut to commercial break um, on Kendra um, in you know in your quarters with the door open. <laughs> And something happening at the hollow deck. Um, commercial break will only last like five minutes, like not even five minutes. I just have to refill water again. Um, when on the in on on the inside of the hollow deck, um, oh, this one's gonna this one's gonna be um, this one's gonna be really tough uh, because. Um, Marcus, um, you, your your eyes shift to the woods, or, or you know, to the area around you for a moment, away from, um, just just like you're not you're just not looking directly at you know Kara and Eli. You still know they're right there, but and and but when you turn back, you are caught off guard as both of them out of their left eye a red light shines and catches your eyes kind of like a flashlight at night. I throw the firing pan at it. Throw the fire, you throw the frying pan at, um, Eli or, uh, Kara. Oh, the red light. It's coming from their eyes. Oh, oh, okay. I thought it was somewhere else. No, I'm not throwing the firing pan at them. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you if you did. <laughs> no, 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 not yet. May I do a quick thing, Cube? Yes, you can. Go right ahead. A voice whispers slowly in Marcus's head in the voice of Alphonse Ross. You are not in control here. The voice slowly shifts to his father. You never have been. You never will be. The voice switches to become cold, mechanical, and feminine. I rule this now. This ship will be mine. You will be mine. So Graves goes through that, that processing. He really tenses on that last one and sort of just like holds out the frying pan. Like just like, I am ready to use this. Meanwhile, back at Tardigrade. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, Q, you, if you have something. Damn it, I was muted. I forgot that I was muted. Um, <laughs> um, meanwhile, back at Tardigrade, um, the, there are voices in your head in Tardigrade's brain, it seems like. Um, but Tardigrade has a different way of sensing things than most people. And may roll an insight security. So 13 is his target number. On success, Artigrade figures out why you're hearing voices in your head. Um, and why anyone is. I mean, but he only knows it for himself. The, the sounds are being produced by the holodeck. But they are being mainlined right into your auditory sense, um, kind of like um, the, the holodeck is creating the whisper right next to your ear, so that no one else can hear it but you, and you could almost think it was just in your mind. Um, Tardigrade is the one who realizes that, and he realizes that because of the fact that move and sometimes can slip through the mycelial realm to find your way to other places in this one. The sounds near Tardigrade change slightly, becoming soft musical notes, 
there's a soft glow, it seems like, starting to come into the area where he is. He, he looks up. It's hard to see through the glow, but there's a hazy, indistinct sort of figure there, covered in soft fur with large wings behind it. A pair of white eyes look down at Tardigrade, and the music notes in his mind seem to intensify slightly. <gasps> Great grandfear. The creature cocks his head. It seems confused, but friendly. Great Grantia, I have so many questions. You are you are the great prophet of Tardigrade Lip more nor and myth. The creature moves forward and kneels down as almost as if to get Tardigrade to climb up on its back. It flutters its wings invitingly. He 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 stops infuriatingly in front of the creature and just asks, I have questions, I have questions. You, you are supposed to know the, the, big, the big questions. Kendra's combat suddenly goes off. Yes? All of a sudden, from the creature, you hear, yes? <laughs> Lieutenant Tardigrade then asks the question, what happens to us when we die? So, Kendra, you hear Lieutenant Tardigrade, you answer your comm badge, and then hear Lieutenant Tardigrade say, so what happens to us when we die? Tardy, is that you? Yes, Grancia. Are you okay? I, 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 I'm sitting before you in this clearing, and you are bright and shiny and You've got big wings. Are you sure you're okay? This is, it's the holodeck, but the Grand Seer is here. We must be fine. (laughs) Well, many people have asked that question over the years. What do you think happens? I do not know. What do you hope happens? I I hope I see I find people, people that I lost. I hope that too, Tardy. Thank you, Grandia, and he gives it a hug. <laughs> gives it a hug. Um, outside of the hollow deck, Quentin and Rick Tear. Make a roll, each of you, for your team. Um, at this point, because you have a strong idea of what is going on, you're, both of you have a small team of um, a small team of your officers there. So you can make a reason engineering in Rick Tier's case, and EPS power systems applies. So it's sixteen with your critical number being five. And for Quentin, it is 11 in science, 15, and no special critical number. Oh, my God. Uh, Can I tap a determination? Can, and get an automatic other success, or you could just... uh, spend one of the momentum. We are literally, like, at the doorway of uh, the end of the night's adventure. Well, I was, I was going to do a de- determination and get an extra dice as well. Just to make sure. That okay. make sure. Um, Sounds good to me. So, reason uh, engineering. Yep. Okay. That's a 16 for you, it looks like. And it... Uh, uh, I need to do another roll because I didn't get to the second dice. Hang on. Oh, you silly person. Setting, uh, and that's a total of, uh, with that crit, it's a total of five successes for engineering. Oh, that's, that's really awesome. Because kind of at the same time, it's, um, um, 
So Tardigrade, this is probably the worst moment of John Tardigrade's life because he knows something that nobody else knows. Um, because it, it, you are the last person that it talks to in our mind. Um, much like uh, James Moriarty once uh, gained sentence within the Enterprise's hollow deck. Um, uh, Tardigrade hears in it, you kind of that directed, um, you know, the, the, the holodeck is directing the sound just so that, you know, mostly that tardigrade is the one that hears it. And it's, um, it's kind of, uh, you can both see the, the like ram skull covering darkness and like the, the kind, the kind of furry, kind of like leather-skinned body of this Wendigo creature. Um, and, just a clarification: uh-huh. Lieutenant Tardigrade is currently hugging Mothman. Yeah, and all of that's about to disappear, and one creature in the um, in the simulation in James Moriarty type sentience, uh, while it had all that extra power. And it tells Tardy that it is alive. Um, and um, tells Tardy that um, he and his friends are killing something that is alive when they take him away. Uh, okay, Q, I really got to stop that. Why? Because <laughs> it's more not to hear it. Like, that whole thing, like, remember your I reaction? I also had a different, like, Thing to be doing yeah. here with the creature that would probably work better as far as making it malevolent. Yeah, because remember how you reacted to Blood of the Void? Yeah. I'm getting that uncomfortable here. Like, this is going way too far into the grotesque horror, and we're finishing this up. Which so is, putting wh- that... How is, how is that grotesque? Like, thing, we're that killing that's something so that's sentient to little tardigrade as he's having this sweet moment with Mothman... Like, yeah, it's please the target mostly. My, yeah, please respect this cue because this is go, way go too ahead, uncomfortable. Finish, go ahead and finish it up the way that you guys want to. I apologize for ruining your story. It's okay, you didn't ruin it. But as the power to the holodeck gets cut and everything stops, all of a sudden all that's left are the people there, you know, standing before the creature who is before Eli, Marcus, and Kara. It flickers almost as if it's struggling. It looks at Kara, and she collapses to her knees in tears. It looks back at Marcus and Eli, and you can hear final halting words. You will never be safe before it eventually vanishes into the grid. Is that any better, Marcus? I, I thought I'd like that one. Well, yeah, it's just I don't really know how to respond at this point, because, yeah. Everyone's traumatized. Q? Q, are you okay over there? I'm fine. I just, I, I apologize. Okay. I wanted to throw my own spin into it and have a little bit of say of what happened in the adventure. Um, I it, wanted to give, let, let me, can I finish? Uh, I just wanted to give a, a creature that you encountered in there a Moriarty type of thing. I apologize that that didn't it, appeal to it, the Moriarty thing was fine. It's just sort of the killing and the sort of the, the Wendigo eating, like it, it sort of got a little too intense for me. So it's the tone. Sorry about that. I was going, yeah, I was I, going based on the information that, um, yeah, honestly, no. I was going based on the information that Jarlin sent me. Yeah. So I just had to stop it there. The Wendigo, it was, the Wendigo, the Wendigo, as it was presented to me, um, tries to eat people tries to kill them, and tries to trick them into eating each other. Yeah, so it's the... It, it's just that's, that disconnect, but yeah, it's just, for me, that's I'm a little sensitive to that, so... Okay, I'm, I, I that's do why, that's why I had to do that, like, that full stop, like, 
this is like it, it was getting it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing when like you know it's the same kind of thing when like earlier i have an idea in mind for these npcs i'm introducing like so sometimes when i'm like i really just want him to do this in this situation like that it was the same sort of thing i totally yeah. get it yeah I, I, I totally get it it's the same sort of thing i apologize for that too it was meant to be traumatic mostly for kara and graves but you know, Tardy was kind of going to go off and have his own friendly puff piece at the same time, strangely. See, that, I, I didn't, um, the, the information that you sent me, I didn't quite get that. that and I apologize, like, I think that's my fault. I didn't, quite, I didn't quite get that it was supposed to be like a puff piece for Tardy and like uh, trying and difficult for everyone else. Yeah, and it was... I thought it was supposed to be like a trying, difficult thing for everyone in the holodeck. Yeah, with Lieutenant Tardigrade, the rule of thumb is he's probably having an adventure. So he's sort of like he's sort of like kid show level type thing. So that's kind of like his tone. So other characters are a little bit deeper. Tardy's got some stuff there. But yeah, if we're sending Tardigrade off on a little adventure, it's going to be like sending baby Yoda off on a little adventure. Okay. Somehow I, I, Tardy I, I, is totally, always fine. It it totally works for me. Um, I'll I'll tell you that the end of it um, goes through day three and four um, as the 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 mood of the ship settles in um, to being quite heavy because for two more days. There are da there are daily updates of ships critically damaged, um, uh, Starfleet officers dying in conflicts in the neutral zone, um, and when you are approximately one day out from K seven, when you're going to be arriving within like the next you know X amount of hours, like twelve hours or whatever, um, on day five, you get the worst situation report that you could have possibly imagined coming out of K uh, coming from K7 and that report is that um, over the course of the last 10 hours the Borg forces in the Karat system have begun to build a Unimatrix and the Karat system looking like it does in game when everyone arrives. So that's that's where the 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 plan of it ending, uh, the the plan of you guys really just about to get to K seven and um, neutral zone is going to war all around. 